thank you for the good day that, that, that we have. Lord, to hear your word, to fellowship, and to, uh, to just to, just to <coughs> enjoy being, being together. O oh, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us today. Fill our hearts with your presence. And fill this, this very room with your power. And let us see your glory. O oh God, we ask it in thy name. Amen. I like that. Look up in prayer. Look back to remind what God has done. Like that. And look ahead. And you didn't realize that you got your therapy in for the day. <laughs> Pretty good. That's good. Yeah. Well, we're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And it occurred to me as, as listening and reading through the Gospels, and I, I uh, read through all the passages, of course, as, as I usually do, but I do tend to get tunnel vision once I select the text. And uh, it occurred to me that, that, uh, that, that the Gospel text from uh, Matthew 15 uh, deserves a, a little bit of comment and explanation because it, it just seems troubling to, to hear those words come from our Lord's mouth, doesn't it? Uh, what he said to, to that woman. And uh, he, he, Lord, my daughter is severely demon possessed, but he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. For she cries out after us. And then he says, but he answered, I was sent, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, if you study that and look at that, there's a cross-reference to, um, I don't have it in my Bible. It looks like it's Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30, which is the parallel passage. And what we're dealing with here is, is we're dealing with the, the Gentiles, if you notice from the Old Testament text that Jensen read, as well as this text, it's dealing with the uh, contrast between the, 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 the way that the Gentiles live and, and, and so on, and ultimately the gospel going to the Gentiles. And even though it seems difficult to understand why Jesus would respond the way he did in that passage, ultimately the passage is a promise of hope because the gospel did go ultimately to the Gentiles, of which that is us. We're the Gentiles. We're the Greek. As we looked at Romans 1.16 this morning in our confirmation class, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God for salvation, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And I, and I thought, you know, as a, as a young Christian, I thought, what, what is this business of this distinction between the Jew and the Gentile? Well, that's the Jew was the Jew, of course, and the Gentile was everybody else. But it was a big deal for the gospel to go from the Jewish people to the Gentiles. And that's what all three of these texts deal with. Chapter 4 of Philipp of 1 Thessalonians, and I, and I love chapter 4. Finally then, brethren, as we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you <coughs> received from us, how you ought to walk in order to please God. What is a Christian, or who is a Christian? That's an interesting question, particularly this week, isn't it? Who is a Christian? Our president says he's a Christian. Judge Antonin Scalia is said to have been a Christian. I watched the funeral yesterday. Anybody have a chance to watch the funeral of uh, Supreme, or Supreme Court Justice? Antonin Scalia. Candidate Trump is also said to be a Christian, as well as Rubio Cruz, as well as Ben Carson, who is very outspoken in his Christian uh, testimony. What is a Christian? And you all heard about how this, this banter, I shouldn't say banter, but the conversation between the Pope even got involved, didn't he, this week? as to 
what is a Christian? Well, this passage in chapter 4 deals with one of the main elements of being a Christian, and that is this business called sanctification. And what is sanctification? As my pastor said over and over again, sanctification and justification are two different things. Justification is very critical. Justification is for us. You got that? For us. Sanctification is in us. <coughs> Justification is for us. Sanctification is in us. And unfortunately, one of the doctrines that, that and, and maybe I'm guilty of this, of, of, of creating this, but one of the doctrines that is neglected is the doctrine of sanctification. And that is a process of a Christian growing in his faith and his relationship to Jesus Christ. And as my pastor used to say, sanctification is the process of bringing our lives in harmony with what we already have in Christ. Let me say that again. It's a process of bringing our lives in harmony with what we already have in Jesus Christ. And so our lives need to be a continual growth in grace, as it is expressed often in another way. But back to our week, the, 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 the news and the events of this week regarding the, the, the political candidates and so on. What is a Christian? My question, what is a Christian? And my answer is, I guess we learn from the duck. If it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it is a duck. And, and that's, that's the, the honest truth. And, and here's the deal, and this is going to get into some dicey things to think about, and so bear with me, I'm going to try to get fast to kind of keep things moving. Because I've got it all written down, and I'm trying not to, 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 to stray. If any of us make a claim in every, in every other area, that claim must be backed up by something. So you got that. If we make a claim, the claim has to be backed up. But somehow, some way, exception is made for the claim of being a Christian. In other words, anybody can claim to be a Christian with no verification. Is this judging? That is the reason given to not to question another's claim. We don't know what's in their heart, which is true. We don't want to judge. We certainly have the command of our Lord in Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that ye be not judged. Matthew 7, 2 through 5, which, which I won't take the time to read, but right after that statement in verse 1, it says, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? We also read in Romans chapter 2, verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for whenever, whenever you judge another, you condemn yourself. While judging is deadly serious, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't want to soft pedal this business of judging. Judging another person is deadly serious. And, and, and I've already quoted the scripture that teaches that. But while judging is deadly serious, one's claims of following Christ must be demonstrated and visible. Urban Luther, pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, asked this question of his congregation in its broadcast last week. Are you a good person? And listen carefully to his answer. He said, if you answer yes, you are probably not a Christian. <coughs> wow. Did he just judge there? Because, and here's his answer. Because a Christian will understand that in and of themselves they are not good. Romans 3, 10 and 11. This is fundamental theology. Romans 3, 10 and 11. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. And there is none who does good, no, not one. And, and this doctrine that of, of, of uh, I can't think of it right off the bat, but this doctrine of, of the human condition is, is, is a basic doctrine. And, and we need to understand basic doctrines such as this. And, and I, would, I, would, I would be 
curious to know how many people would answer that question, yes, thus revealing a tragic um, misunderstanding of basic Christian doctrine. And, and maybe that's a good indicator of where we stand in, in terms of, 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 of our basic doctrine of understanding things. Romans 3, 10, and 11, there is none righteous, no, not one. Okay, the first thing that we see here in this passage of Scripture is that to abound, the true Christian is to abound more and more. It says in verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk, to please God. And Paul uses this illustration of walking, and that's why I use walk like a duck. Paul uses this illustration of walking to illustrate the Christian life. The Christian life is a walk. When I was a young person, I used to, we used to ask the question, how's your walk? Or, or one of the deacons would come up to one of the younger people and say, how's your walk with God? That's where the term comes from. Hence the claim of being a Christian should walk like a duck and quack like a duck. One expects to see some fruit. Remember Matthew 7. Remember Matthew 7 when it, Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. Look down, and, and, and I would encourage you to look it up. Look down at verses 15 and 16 of that same chapter. And remember 7.1 says, 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 Judge not. 7, 2 through 4 is the, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? That's all the same chapter, Matthew 7. But look at verses 15 and 16 where Jesus is still speaking and he says, beware of false prophets. Huh? How are we supposed to beware of a false prophet? I said, I, you know, if, a prophet, if somebody says something, we're not supposed to judge. Who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, and you will know them by their fruits, Jesus says. Same chapter. So in other words, we are to be fruit inspectors. <laughs> how, do we, how do we decide whether we're judging or fruit inspectors? Humility should accompany a Christian. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. One of the fundamental marks of a Christian is that a Christian is humble. Evangelist told the story about this, this young person that got a, a pen. Remember back in the, in the days when you'd get a pen for Sunday school? He got a pen that said humility. Remember those things? You'd, 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 you'd get the little pens and then they'd, they'd kind, of, kind of hang from each other. He got the humility pin. I don't know if there's such a, such a pin, but it's part of the story. And the next week, he wore it. He wore the humility pin, and then they took it away from him. He wasn't humble anymore. The mark of a Christian is that he is humble, James 4, 6. And maybe there is people in the public life that could take the message from that. Here's where the judging takes place. When one's claims of being a Christ follower are not followed up by a life of spiritual growth, humility, and here's something else, spiritual hunger. I see these precious little ones here. I'm so glad that, that, that we have a bunch of these little, little children in our congregation, but they get hungry, and what happens when they get hungry? They scream, don't they? Maybe not yours. But they, but they let you know. <coughs> Do we feed that spiritual hunger? One of the marks of life is hunger. Do you have a hunger for God's word? And if you don't have a hunger for God's word, there, there's, there's something wrong. You need to see a doctor. You don't have an appetite. It's doubtful if they are truly saved, if there is not a growth. That's why Paul says that you should abound more and more. You see that in verse 1 of our text. But scripture clearly teaches that there must be evidence of the claims of being a Christ follower. And the absence of evidence is a bad sign. So remember, if you claim to be a Christ follower, if somebody claims to be a Christ follower, 
If there's not evidence, that's a bad sign. Peter, the first apostle, stated in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, now listen to this, this is important, as newborn babes desire pure spiritual milk of the word that you may grow thereby. The pure spiritual milk of the word is essential for our Christian growth. Peter himself compares it to mother's milk and how essential that is. I can't judge you to others, or I can't judge even to your face. But what Scripture is teaching us, that we can state the reality in general terms, that is something that is corroborated by Holy Scripture and by godly men and women over the <clears throat> centuries. If you don't have a hunger for the Word, for worship, for fellowship with other believers, your claims of Christianity are hollow at best. If you don't have a hunger for the word, for worship, for fellowship with other believers, your claims of Christianity are hollow at best. Somebody says, but my faith is intensely personal. Well, that's certainly true for all of us. That's true for all of us. But if it's so personal that nobody knows about it, I wouldn't bank on it. You've got to come to terms with Romans 10, 9, and 10. That if you confess with your mouth, confession with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with a heart, one believes, there's that personal heart, you know, my face is intensely personal part. And with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And by the way, confession is the secret to assurance of salvation. If you have difficulty with the assurance of salvation, it's because, quite often, because the individual has not been sharing his faith and, and confessing and, 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 and opening up his mouth, as, as Romans 10, 9 and 10, 10 says. You don't have to be a preacher, but you have to give testimony at some point. That's what confirmation is all about. That's why we have confirmation. And that's why we're going to be scheduling confirmation. Either the, what, what, what were we talking about? One of those last few weeks in May. It's five Sundays in May. And we're going to pick, pick one that's, that's the best one. But that's what confirmation is. They come up here and they stand in front of everybody. And they say, I promise, vocally and verbally, out loud, to live my Christian life. That's what confirmation is. And that's just the beginning. Third, secondly, the true Christian is to abstain from evil. Now sanctification, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, and each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in, vessel in sanctification and honor. There is one more thing to say about this. Within the liberal church, there is universal, where universalism is denied officially, the ELCA, for example, the belief and statement exists that all are God's children. You've heard that before, I'm sure. Therefore, to imply that anyone except a hypocrite is lost or not a Christian is violating Matthew 7, 1, committing the serious sin of judging. In other words, the liberal churches believe that we are basically all saved, that we are all God's children. Although that not officially. But that's what the general public believes out there. And that's what they're led to be, that's what they're taught. And the implication then of that belief is that when you and I imply that there is such a possibility that somebody could be lost, we are judging. And that's why there is controversy over whether adherents of other religions are going to be saved. And you folks, you see, the, you see the slippery slope that we're on at this point. Own family members stood there in front of me and emphasized that all are God's people. That all people are God's children. And the slippery slope is the next step is that Muslims are God's children and Hindus are God's children. And that's exactly what the average people believe. And, and the, another basic doctrine of Christianity, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
and if we worship the same God, what was Jesus talking about? <coughs> if we all worship the same God, what in the world was Jesus talking about? No man comes to the Father but by me. I've been following the issue at Wheaton College and the departure of Dr. Marcia Hawkins, who stated she was wearing a burqa before Christmas this last year in solidarity with the Muslims and stated that they worship the same God. I worship to, I, I listened to nearly a two hour debate one Monday afternoon between Nabil Qureshi and Marislav Volk on January 19th. Nabil is a converted Muslim who loves Jesus and argued skillfully and emphatically that they are not the same gods. And if you don't believe that anyone will be lost, why send missionaries? And in the denominational churches, missionary work is only humanitarian. Before I move on to that paragraph, this, this Marislav Bull, who argued that, that, that all are the same gods, in other words, the Muslim's God and the Christian God is the same, his name was, was, first name was Marislav, and last name was V-O-L-F, both. He also was one of the authors of the document that was printed in 2007 and appeared in the New York Times of Christians and Muslims together. I don't know if you remember that. Where over 300 Christian leaders signed that document, included were Bill Hybels and, and uh, the, the, the Saddleback guy. That's a slippery slope if you believe that all are God's children. But no, Isaiah said, woe is unto me. Isaiah, as he saw God's glory, he said, woe is unto me, for I am unclean. For I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, and my eyes will have seen the king. And then a few seconds after that, God says, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Was Isaiah wrong? Was Isaiah wrong when he said, woe is me, for I dwell among the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king. If you don't believe that anyone will be lost, in other words, universalism, why send missionaries? And this is the question that is being answered in denominational churches as they have stopped sending the missionaries, at least, to preach the gospel. And in denominational churches, missionary is now only humanitarian. And there's nothing wrong with that. Humanitarian missions and ministry is essential. But here's the thing. It's only feeding the hungry because they don't believe in reaching the lost. Why? Because they are already God's children and then we don't need to spend the time preaching the gospel. But that is why it is so critical nowadays, friends, that we support missions that preach the gospel. We need to support humanitarian work as well because the humanitarian work opens the door for the gospel. But if we stop at that, we are losing a great opportunity. I'm not skirting verse 3 of our text. Things are bad today, many young adults. Verse 3 said, talks about sexual immorality. Things are bad today, many young adults have completely rejected the sexual morals of their parents. And I'm not saying that in just general senses. That, 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 that is true. Completely Free and open relationships, completely disregarding scripture. And, and that is a sad reality that is taking place right now with the young people. They have not embraced, by and large, the commitment of one man, one woman for life in the matrimony of marriage. Now there, thankfully, are many exceptions Thankfully, there are many, many exceptions of that. But note well, the verse 3 of our text, for this is God's will, 
your sanctification that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Why does Paul go there directly in, to, in verse 3? Why not some other issues? For years, Robbie Zacharias and others have quoted many atheists and philosophers who ultimate, ultimately admitted leaving the Christian faith because they didn't want to follow the Sixth Commandment. What it all boiled down to is that they didn't want to follow the Sixth Commandment. That was their ultimate motivation. Right now our society is going full speed in the wrong direction and, and it could be painful for those who don't get out of the way. Thirdly, the true Christian is to love a brother. Verse 9 and verse 1, you see that? But, but concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Men and women, we need to love one another. We've got to make it serious. And, there are, and, and then there are children who don't know God. Children's ministry must involve evangelism. But we need to weep over the souls of men. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit, we need to take seriously. But, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. I think I missed one in there, but there's nine of them. The issue is, as, as a Christian, we need to abound more and more. So many are stagnant in their faith. Abounding in verse 1 means doing the hard things like apologizing. It means changing our attitudes towards a person. It means looking in the mirror and doing some introspection on the tractor in the barn or at the desk or at the kitchen table. It means checking the log in your own eye before getting all uptight and bothered about the speck in somebody else's eye. It means moving forward with what you know God wants you to do, whether getting into the whether it's getting into the Word or fellowship and prayer. You know, an object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Let's get going. If you are accused of being a Christian, make sure there is enough evidence for a conviction. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this is a strong, strong message. But Lord, we thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ that we all can start at the same place. None of us can point a finger at anybody else. We are all in equal need of grace and forgiveness and cleansing. We are all like Isaiah. Woe is me, for I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips, and I am a man of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King. O Spirit of God, continue to speak to us, we pray in thy name. Amen.